Lord, we do want to come to you today, and we, we thank you once again that you're God. Lord, we are so gracious, or grateful to you that we can come knowing that you are sovereign over all things. And Father, we look around the world and we continue to, to, to be concerned by the troubles, the unrest, Lord, the, just the, the great fear. It seems to be encompassing so much of our, our world right now. But Lord, we know that you are in charge. We know that you are working your perfect plan. We know that you are gracious and good and that you are working in your people for their, for their good. To make them like your son. Lord, you're working in this world. We know you are working to, to draw men to you, that men will repent and trust you as Savior. And so, Lord, I pray that that work will continue to be evident. And Father, again, I pray for us that we may be bold in preaching the gospel as we speak to those who are disturbed by the unrest of our day. Lord, that we will point them to the hope of Christ. And Lord, we thank you especially that we can say, this world is not my home. That we know we are pilgrims and we're strangers. We are people looking for a city built by you. And Lord, that everything here we know is just fleeting. So very temporary. And so Lord, can give us that comfort that comes only from you, from your word, from that eternal perspective. And Father, in these ones that are dealing with the sicknesses, and we think especially those dealing with the coronavirus, I pray for healing. And pray for Chuck and Vicki today that you will strengthen their bodies, that they'll be, uh, Lord, recovering quickly from this. Lord, for Gloria, as she is recovering from her ailment, Lord, that you will strengthen her uh, also, that they may each be uh, up and about and back to 100% very quickly. Lord, others that uh, we know that may have it or may be still dealing with, it, with friends and family members that have it, that you'll just, again, give an abundance of grace that in all of this, they would see your mighty hand. And Father, as well, I'm mindful of those in, in our church and in our community that are uh, in the healthcare profession, that are, are dealing with patients and are having themselves to, to confront on a daily basis uh, this, this sickness. And so I pray that you will continue to protect them, uh, Lord, not just physically, but protect them spiritually, mentally, and emotionally as they Go day by day, Lord, that they will rest in you. They will have that, that confidence and comfort that only comes from knowing you. And Lord, we are mindful as well of other churches. We know that Manistique Bible Church is not the only church. We know that you are actively working in many different communities across this world. And Lord, that we are joined together with them in a bond that is, is really greater than we can describe. A bond that is real and eternal. And so, Lord, I pray for um, the church down in Sparta, that you will give them wisdom today. Lord, I don't, I don't know if they're making any decisions today or not, but I pray that you'll give them wisdom, give them grace, give them hope and help as they uh, go forward, and as they look to build this building, that they may serve you better, be more effective in their ministry there, that you will encourage them, and you'll provide for them and all the many needs that will arise that you will show your power and your glory in that church. And we pray that for us here, that you will show your power and glory in us today. We ask all this in your precious and your holy name. Amen. What is the church? Is it the building that we meet in on Sundays? Is the church a denomination like the Lutheran church or the Presbyterian church or the Baptist church? Is the church the whole realm of Christianity that includes all true believers in Jesus? Or is any gathering of Christians a church? So that if a couple Christian friends meet in a coffee shop and talk about the Bible, is that a church? Now, understanding what the Bible teaches about the church is of utmost importance. Because our definition of church affects how we understand our relationships to one another here. And periodically, I take some time to remind us who Manistique Bible Church is. Last year, about the same time last year, I took just one message and talked about what makes us distinct. 
I think the last time that I spent a few weeks on this topic was back in 2017. And so I want to take the next several weeks to think about who Manistique Bible Church is. And so turn to Matthew or Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. And, and to start off, we're going to think about a biblical definition and a biblical description of a church. And be, so before we can discuss who Manistique Bible Church is, we must first know what a church is. And so I want to start off in Ephesians 5 and actually Ephesians 2 as well, because I'm not going to look today at a single passage of Scripture, but I want to, I want to begin with these two passages, and then we're going to branch out, and we're going to look at a number of different passages uh, uh, today. But in Ephesians chapter 5, it's actually addressing the husband's relationship to love his wife. But in doing so, it tells us a lot about the relationship of Jesus with his church. And so Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So all men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So there he tells us about the relationship that the church has with Christ. Tells us of the love Christ has for his church, which in part tells us some of how we should love one another. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 is maybe a little bit more of a challenging passage because he's talking about the renewed relationship within the church, or that is the church. Because until the New Testament times, there was no church. You had Jews and you had Gentiles. And now in the New Testament, we see the introduction of a third group of people, different from Jew, different from Gentile, now called the church. And part of what he's addressing in Ephesians is how Jew and Gentile are brought together in the church. And so verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 2 he says, now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners. No more are you outsiders, are you aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. There it tells us some of the uniqueness and the incredible privilege that is the church. And so let me begin by kind of summarizing uh, the Bible's teaching about the church. And first I would say the church is central to God's plan for this age. So what right now the church is central to all that God is doing. The church is also central to the spiritual life and health of the Christian. So everything God is doing in the world today to redeem people to himself involves the church. And also, we cannot stress how important the church is for you and for me. For us to grow in Christ, we need the church. We also cannot stress enough how important the church is for our community, our nation, and the world. It is vital for the, for the whole world that there be healthy, strong, growing churches. The church, as Chuck Colson said, is the only institution supernaturally endowed by God. It is the one institution of which Jesus promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You think about that for a second. It's the one institution. We talk about the American way of life. We talk about the American Republic. 
And this, this system of freedom, this democratic constitutional republic that we currently have, it is a marvelous system. But it has absolutely no divine promise that it is going to remain and that it is going to stand firm forever. In fact, we know exactly the opposite. We know from scriptures that America itself eventually is going to be overthrown. And that we are going to see ultimately the crumble of, crumbling of all kingdoms of the world. And we see, it, though, from Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says very specifically that the church is built, is built on him. He is its foundation. And it will not fail. That hell itself cannot prevail against the church. And so when we talk about the church, we are talking about a special creation of God. Something that God planned before the world began. Something that He is now using to bring Him glory, to strengthen His children, and to evangelize the law. We see the church begin in Acts chapter 2, and then that book of Acts details the spread of the gospel and the formation of churches throughout the Roman Empire. We go to the New Testament and we find that the majority of New Testament books were written to a church or multiple churches. And so we can know what the church is because 15 books in the New Testament were written to churches. And in those letters, they give to us a solid understanding of the church. So what does the New Testament tell us the church is? It tells us six things. The church is the people of God, the family of God, and the flock of God. The church is the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. The church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And these six statements are a wealth of truth. I could spend a whole sermon on each individual statement. It is just full of great things that it tells us. But I'm just going to highlight a couple things from them this morning. And the first thing is the church is the people of God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 say, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. So before salvation, we were not the people of God. We were outsiders. After salvation, we are now the people of God. We are made the people of God. In fact, we are brought into what the Old Testament refers to as a new covenant. This covenant that God made with the nation of Israel, at salvation, Christians are brought into and made benefactors of that covenant. And that covenant includes the promise that we have been given a new heart. We, our sin has been forgiven. So that now we can enter into a personal relationship with God. And this is one of the most marvelous things I see in the Old Testament, particularly the book of Ezekiel. He says it over and over and over again. I will be your God and you will be my people. It's defining a unique and a peculiar relationship between God and people. So that we, as his people, willingly bow before him and do his will. We voluntarily acknowledge him to be our king. We are his subjects. We are citizens of his great kingdom. And so that we have a relationship with God that no other people in the world have. There is no nation on the planet that can say we are uniquely the people of God right now. We go to the church and we say the church is the people of God in this time. We have a unique relationship with God so that we can say we are His and He is ours. But it's not just a, a political relationship. It's not just a relationship of a king to a subject. We are also the family of God. If you're still in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, that is, we are no longer not the people of God. We are now His people. We are fellow citizens with the saints. There's the kingdom. We are subjects, citizens together of this kingdom, and 
of the household of God. That King James word household just simply means family. As the family of God, we are children in His household. He is our Heavenly Father. That is an incredible statement. And what, it's not just poetry. We're not just describing the, the great feelings that we have towards God. We are describing an, the absolute fact of a relationship. He is our Father. We are His children. We have all of the privileges that go along with being children of God. He gives to us all of the love and care that any would expect from a loving Father. So the church is not just a people of God, a kingdom, or a people in a kingdom. It is also a family, the family of God, and it is also the flock of God. Acts 20, verse 28, Paul warns the elders of the church in Ephesus, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. 1 Peter 5, verse 2, instructs pastors to feed the flock of God which is among you. The church is God's flock. It is His sheep that He loves, tends, and watches over. So we can say with King David, the Lord is my shepherd. He supplies all our needs. He cares for us in all seasons of life. He leads us, protects us, and is bringing us into His home to dwell with Him forever. This is the promise. This is the privilege of being the, the flock of God as He is our loving shepherd. And the church is also the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, Now ye are the body of Christ. It's a real simple, clear statement. We are the body of Christ. We are joined together with Jesus so that in a very real way, we are part of Him. We can legitimately and really be called His body. Again, not just in, in poetic terminology, not in, descri in descriptions of trying to explain something that is beyond comprehension, though there is that in there. We are also describing something that is a bedrock reality. We are his body so that what happens to us as a church affects Jesus when Jesus confronted Saul Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus Saul you know Saul he was running around persecuting the church he was in Jerusalem harassing all kinds of people he finally he, he was was convinced that he was going to stomp step out or stamp out Christianity so he got letters to go to Damascus to persecute the church there. And so on the way to Damascus, he is confronted by Jesus. And Paul is laying there in the road, in the dirt. And Jesus confronts him about Paul's persecution of the church. But Jesus does not say, why do you persecute my church? Jesus says, why do you persecute me? The Gospels tell us, Jesus himself says, that if you give just a cup of water to a Christian in his name, he treats it as if you gave it to Jesus himself. So when we say we are the body of Christ, we are saying that we have a part in him, he has a part in us. What happens to us happens to him. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons it's not possible to say I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. If you think little of the church, you think little of Jesus. It's just that simple. The church is His body. That also means Jesus is at work in this world through the church. You may have heard the phrase, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. I've heard it used in ways that I don't think are right, but there's a point there where that phrase is absolutely correct. God, Jesus has chosen the church to be the instrument of accomplishing His will in this world. We are His body. And we are His bride. So we saw that in Ephesians chapter 5. We are engaged to Him. We are committed to marriage with Him. And when He returns for the church, He will do so as a groom 
coming for His bride. That whole picture of the husband and wife relationship in Ephesians 5 wraps around this picture of Jesus' relationship with the church. So we can legitimately say the church is wedded to Christ. A couple weeks ago, Dennis, he's not here this morning, but Dennis gave me a DVD that talked about all the marriage pictures that Jesus used in his teachings. And actually, it's quite impressive. We go to the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Supper borrows elements from the Jewish marriage proposal. The promise, I go to prepare a place for you, was based on the Jewish wedding customs of that day. We go to the book of Revelation, and we find in Revelation that the church is going to join Jesus in a great wedding feast. It's going to be a celebration of the bride and groom finally united. The church is Christ betrothed, his bride waiting for that wedding day. Now, there's nothing in the, in the New Testament that suggests that individual Christians are the bride of Christ. I do need to spell this out and mention this because I know there are some that say that, well, I personally am the bride of Christ. And, and as a guy, that kind of still in the back of my mind, like, no, I'm really, I don't want to be the bride of Jesus. I'm not in the bride thing. I'm the groom. It's the church. The church is the bride of Christ. We are betrothed to him, waiting, looking for that day of consummation. And the church is also the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 teaches that the individual Christian is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But still in Ephesians chapter 2, down in verse 22, it says the church is built up as an habitation of God through the Spirit. So the church, as a, as a church body, is a temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells. God the Spirit uniquely inhabits His church. I, I don't think I understand this. I try to get my mind around this. I don't think I understand it, so I'm going to have a hard time explaining it. But I know it is wonderful. In some marvelous and mysterious way, the Holy Spirit uniquely dwells in the church as a whole. So we would rightly say the church is where the Holy Spirit lives. Now, I don't mean this building. I mean this gathering of people. This building is where the church meets. The building is not the church. The church is you. It's us. Gathered together, and when we gather as a church body, then in some fashion the Holy Spirit is uniquely present. He is present in this church body in a way that seems to be different from that from his presence within each of us. It's not to the exclusion of it. Both are true. He is present within you, and he is present within us as a gathering. Is this not an awesome privilege we this gathering this group of people no matter what our disadvantages may be are the people flock and family of God this church no matter the size of the congregation is the body and bride of Christ this church, no matter the quality of our facilities, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You think about that. All of these things are true. Regardless of our attendance, our popularity, our income, our fashionableness, our success, our influence, the quality of our music, the charisma of the preacher, the ingenuity of our ministries, the skill of our presentation, the novelty of our technology, none of those things change the realities. This church is the people, flock, and family of God, even if we're out meeting in a clearing in the woods. This church is the body and bride of Jesus, even if we have no sound system or live streaming. This church is the temple of the Holy Spirit, even if we have to meet in someone's base basement. These great realities don't change with our external circumstances. 
So that if we are truly a biblical church, it does not matter if we are a wealthy American church with a multi-million dollar campus, a persecuted Chinese church with a different secret meeting place every week, or an impoverished African church with nothing but a piece of ground to sit on. Those churches, all true churches, share in these great truths, regardless of the external regardless of the circumstances. And all of this is what the church is. But actually still doesn't fully tell us what a church is. Because when we're talking about a church, we're talking about an individual group in a specific place. You might use the phrase the local church. And it's the New Testament's teachings about the local church that tell us the essential features of any church, of a church. What must be true for it to be a church? And I don't have time this morning to go through all of them. We're going to pick up some of them next week. So I'm going to start with the first one. And, and when I say the first one, I mean it's really the first in evidence. A group of, uh, for a church to be a church... For a group of people, a group of Christians, to be a church, they must gather. But a church that never meets together is not a church. It's just that simple. If there's no meeting, there's no church. We, we see this repeatedly in the Bible, particularly the book of Acts, but repeatedly, even in the epistles, we see evidence of the church gathering and meeting together. This is also seen in the, the Greek word that is translated now church. The word is one you may have heard before, or at least heard part of it before. It's the word ecclesia. We talk about something being ecclesiastical. It comes from that Greek word. It means of the church. But actually, the, the word itself, ecclesia, is a Greek word that initially just means an assembly of the people. It was often used to refer to a special meeting, an official meeting uh, of the people to, to make a decision. So like we might say a township meeting today. You know, everybody gathers together and voice their thoughts and opinions and a, and a decision is made. That would have been an ecclesia. It was also used, for example, the book of Acts in chapter 19. It talks about uh, a group of people that were rioting. They were causing trouble because of Paul's ministry and they were upset. Because Paul was teaching people not to worship Diana. And, um, and so they, they were upset and they met together. They gathered together in this, uh, this big amphitheater type thing. And caused an uproar. And they were called repeatedly an assembly. They were called an unlawful assembly. But they were an assembly. And the fact that it was a group of people meeting together to do something. We come to the church and we find that the, the New Testament uses this word church in a very specific way. It refers to a group of Christians. Most often it refers to a group of Christians in an individual location, in an individual city, or sometimes broader in a region. And it also tells us that the, this was an assembly called out of the world by God. So it's not just any assembly, but it's an assembly of people who've been called out. Acts 15 says that God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. So it says God took out of the Gentiles his people, a people for himself. That's the church. They have been called out of the world out of their former relationships, out of their former religions, out of their former identities to become now members together of the church of God. And so you have it as called out. But again, the key idea is that of gathering. So it's not just a group or a group of Christians in a city or a region. But rather, the, the way the New Testament most often uses this word is it is talking about people that met together at regular intervals. You may have heard the phrase, don't go to church, be the church. That phrase irritates me a lot. Um, 
You, you can't be the church if you don't go to church. It's just that simple. And, and, and I understand. I, I will say, if, if some, sometimes it's used to say, hey, it's not just about attending a service or being in a building. You have to do that which is the church is supposed to do. You have to be that which the church is supposed to be. And I understand that. Um, but you can't, again, you cannot be the church is, if you're not gathered. And, and so you can't say the church is just what you do. It's, the church is not just how you live your life. The church is not being a Christian in the world. That's being a Christian. The church is gathering. There is no such thing as a church that doesn't gather. And it's interesting to me that we as Americans seem to be pioneers in this we don't really need church idea. We as Americans who have all of the freedoms to worship God, to go to church, we can go to church seven days a week if we wanted to without any government interference. We have a big building, 20 acres here, big old sign out front that proclaims we are a church. We declare all across the community we are a church and we gather here. We have absolute freedom to do so. And all across America, we have, everyone has this freedom to go and be a part of the church. And we also have all across America, people say, well, we don't really need church. And then you go to a place like China, where they don't have that freedom. And you know what they do every week? They meet. And they insist upon it. They are urgent about it. And they say, our church is forbidden. It is illegal and absolutely essential that we gather together. We have to cram into a little apartment. We have to whisper our songs when we sing. But we are going to meet because the church is essential. I think we've got something backwards here in America. Because the church is a church when it assembles. It is a called out assembly with God, for God. Now, I, I do need to mention a couple more things because I know we are living in strange times. And I want to pull back just a hair. As the coronavirus, we know, has had a profound effect on church attendance. And there are still some churches in lower Michigan that have been unable to meet since March. And, and my heart breaks for them. And there are many churches all across the nation that have had to make drastic changes in their church schedule. Most commonly, they've had to limit how many people can come at any given time. They've had to kind of cycle through people, and so they have multiple services for smaller groups of people. As a church here, I think we've been about as unaffected as we possibly could be. That doesn't mean we're not affected. I mean, we still, we still miss several of our church family that cannot participate in our gatherings because of increased health risk. And, and you should know, and I want to make this really clear, and, and I, I've told them this individually. I don't think these people are being fearful or acting in little faith. They are following the wise counsel of doctors for either their, their own protection or the protection of those close to them. And, and so those who cannot attend, who have legitimate reason to not attend, should not. And I do not intend to rebuke them. It's not the point of this. Throughout history, there have been Christians who could not attend the church for long periods of time because of health, confinement, other valid reasons. These Christians are not considered as forsaking the assembling, even though they're not able to. And so we miss those who are not able to join us. We look forward to and pray for that day when we are able to be re reunited with them on a regular basis. But we cannot, we dare not rebuke them or find fault with them for them in any way. Uh, the side of that coin, though, with the coronavirus and so many churches moving to, to online services, one of the concerns has been that people who stopped attending church are not going to come back. I mean, that's a real danger. I mean, you, you, you know, you get out of the habit of doing something. It's hard to get back in, especially when you have to kind of rearrange your schedule. I mean, it's much easier just to get up on Sunday morning and turn on the TV or the Internet and watch a service. I mean, you can lay in bed and watch online. You don't have to do anything. 
It's a whole lot easier than actually attending. But watching a service is not church. It's just not. And you may, some of you may have picked up on it, but when we did have to cancel our services for a few weeks back in, I think it was March and early April, I was very careful. At no point in time did I refer to our online meeting as church. It was Bible studies, it was services, but never church. Because the New Testament is clear. The church gathers. And watching online doesn't replace that gathering. And so, I mean, we have live streaming. You know, all the stuff we've had to do recently to, to get all the technology stuff worked out here. We, we provide those things. We provide those for two reasons. For those who cannot attend and for those who are thinking about attending. We actually do not restrain the services to replace attending. It's to encourage attendance. For those who have legitimate reasons to not be here, then we, we hope that they make use of it. But to say, well, I'm just going to watch, I'm not going this morning, or I'm going to stop going long term, it's not, it's not being the church. Let me close with two simple truths this morning. And I think they show to us the, the incredible greatness of the church. First, as I've already touched on and we read at the beginning, Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. Let me read that again. Verse 25, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Jesus loved the church so much that he gave himself, gave his own life to purchase it to himself. And we can absolutely say Christ died on the cross for my sin, individually and personally. We also have to say Christ died on the cross for the church. He died on the cross to form the church, to sanctify the church. And ultimately, so the church will be glorified that one day we will stand before Him without blemish. We will one day stand before Him in perfect holiness. As the song says, what a day that will be. And even though we look around us and we see the church, whether it be this church here, whether it be another church in another community, we know every church is not holy and without blemish. There are some spotted, wrinkly churches out there. And Christ loved that church. How can we do any less than love his church? The second thing, Ephesians chapter 3. And I'm going to park on this one a little bit next week, or the next couple of weeks. The church is the eternal plan of God. It's hidden in the Old Testament, but was made known through the apostles. Verse 9 of Ephesians chapter 3. Paul is talking about his apostolic ministry. And he says, it is to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. He's talking about the church here. We're going to see in just a second. Paul's task, part of his ministry, was to preach... To make men see the communion, the fellowship they have in this, this thing called the church. In verse 10, to the intent, or for the purpose, that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. We talk about the church. The church was not an afterthought. The church is not plan B. It's not that God looked and said, okay, I'm going to try it with the Jews first, and if it doesn't work, then I'll have to come up with something else, and he said, oh, we'll do this church thing. It says it was hidden in God in, a, in eternity past. It was eternally purposed by God in Christ Jesus. We talk about the church. The church is no afterthought. 
The church was the plan all along. The church holds a unique and a special place in the working of God, particularly in this age right now. The church is not secondary. Not at all is it something that God said, oh, well, I'll figure something out. Maybe this will work. It is, it is primary. It was eternally chosen by God to exalt him in this community and in heaven forever. We cannot set church aside and begin to diminish it in our thinking and say, well, yeah, I know church is, is important, but it's not that important. It has to be of great significance because the church is the glorious creation of God. We dare not minimize it. We dare not ignore it. Rather, we must rejoice. We must praise God for the privilege of gathering together with His people as part of His family to be the bride of Christ, to be the body of Christ, to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, that in us, as a church, He might be glorified forever. Let's pray. Father, we ask that as we, th we think on these things, and again, we praise You. Lord, I ask that we will keep praising You, that we might see again and again the wonder of this work that you've done and are doing since the days of the apostles. That work that you're continuing now in and through us. And so, Father, I pray that we will elevate the value of the church in our own hearts, in our own lives. And Lord, we will revel in the privilege of joining together with your people. We ask all this in your precious name.